a lot of people like me found things that were intensely personal and really struck a chord in Cheryl's book. And I understand that you leapt into action to option it as soon as you read it. And I wonder if you could tell us what in particular struck a chord with you. Oh, um, well, so much. I mean, it's so interesting as people are seeing the film that they all take something different from it. So for me, I suppose, um, just the idea of this woman being on a journey to find herself doing it completely alone. I think that was the part I kept thinking about even when we were shooting it. Is that could I do this? Well, yeah, I could probably, I could probably hike. I could probably do this, but could I do it all alone for ninety-four days without anyone? And and that was what I found really remarkable. Thank you, Bruna. When you and Reese founded Pacific Standard Films, um, and by the way, launching it with the uh, getting the uh, um, adaptation of Gone Girl off the ground. So well done, ladies. Um, did you have a remit for the kind of films you wanted to see get made? Um, yes, we definitely did. Um, movies with men in them. No, <laughs> only men. There's not enough roles for men. Um, no, we did. We definitely had a remit. We both shared the kind of common goal of developing not just roles for women, but strong, complicated roles for women. And what better piece of material to start with than Wild. So that was the first thing that Reese sent me and that's how we started Pacific Standard, Gone Girl being the second piece. Um, so yeah, that was our remit. Cheryl, one of the things that's very striking in your book is how um, brave and honest you are um, opening up uh, painful and self-destructive experiences. But was it a different kind of scary to contemplate how that could turn out on a, in a film? A very different kind of scary. You know, for years I've been working that muscle as a writer, uh, revealing. Writing is about revelation, it's about opening, it's about telling the truth. Uh, and I've taken a lot of risks and done a lot of scary things as a writer, but I'm in control of it. Those are my words, I decide what stays in and, and, and what, what um, comes out. And when I said yes to Reese and Bruna, and then I said yes to Nick, and then I said yes to Jean-Marc, and I had to trust all of these people and more, uh, to both tell my story, honor my story, be true to it while also making it their own. And so, yeah, I was a bit terrified. And I, I didn't, it didn't really hit me until right before I saw the film for the first time last uh, spring. And I think I was nervous in a way that I have never been before. When I sat down to watch, I was sitting with Bruna and Reese and Jean-Marc and my husband, and I just thought, I mean, here I had to let go. I had to release the truth of my story into other artists' hands. And so, yeah, it was terrifying. And it turned out really well. I'm so uh, proud of the film and the work that these people did. Thank you. Nick, you shot to fame and a national treasurehood by getting into the minds of modern men. But as a screenwriter, you seem to be doing a pretty good job getting into women's heads. I, I, for those who have not read the book and don't know the story, who might ha have the impression that this is a chick flick, what would you say to that? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, you know, it's about grief and heroin addiction and promiscuity and being really, really tough, both physically and mentally. So it's not really like any chick flick I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, it's one woman uh, who happens to be a woman. Uh, so I guess it's a chick flick like the Robert Redford film All Is Lost was a chick flick. Just briefly before we go on, I'd like to, anyone who has anything to tell us what Jean-Marc Vallée brought to the table. Why him? Well, we saw, um, I didn't know, Bruno wanted to say, but we saw Dallas Buyers uh, right before it came out, and we were immediately just awestruck by that film, and we thought, God, could we possibly be able to get him to direct our movie? Um, the way he handles sexuality in that movie, the way that he sort of, he tackled tough subject matter without making it saccharine or maudlin, um, I think he was just incredible, and he read the script right away and called us immediately and said... He actually put another movie to the side that he's making right now. He said, I have to make this film right now. I want to start immediately. So um, we were really fortunate. 
James from the Metro. Um, well done on making the film. Obviously, amazing story of kind of like self discovery and almost self redemption as well. Um, Reese, I wanted to ask you a question. Obviously, kind of like six months before the film went into production, you kind of hit headlines with a little bit of wild behaviour yourself. Oh, do um, you really think that's appropriate? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. relatable. Just because um, I was wondering if you felt that you had any kind of therapeutic experience by like, making this film and putting that behind you. Um. Well, you know, like Cheryl and I were talking about it last night about, um, you know, the boxes that people put people in. I think, you know, um, I had that experience. I certainly learned from that experience. I, I felt terrible about that experience. Um, but I think it was also a, a moment where um, I think people sort of realized I wasn't exactly what they thought I was, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe we, we all... We we like to sort of define people by the ways the the media presents them and that sort of thing. And I think if, if it shows I have a complexity that that people didn't know about, I you know I think that's it's part of human nature. I made a mistake. We make, we all make mistakes. All the best you can do is say sorry and learn from it and move on. Can you tell me about your relationship with your backpack monster? Um. Well. Jean-Marc wanted me on the day. He he purposely made it so that I, I didn't know. Because Cheryl started her hike and she had never backpacked ever. Um, <laughs> he wanted me to have no experience with any of the props. So when you see me putting together the tent, that's me literally putting together a tent. He filmed me for two hours. No one was helping me. So when I'm shaking and I'm going, Jesus fucking Christ, I literally could not figure out the fucking tent. <laughs> and when I kick the stove, it's because I couldn't make the fucking stove work. There um, were no fucks in the script. She just... <laughs> um, yeah, so the backpack... I, you know, being an actor for so many years, I was like, they're going to stuff it full of newspaper. It's no big <laughs> deal. I'm just going to, like, carry it around. And I, we got there on the day, and I put on the thing, and I said to the prop, I just put the newspaper in it. And Jean-Marc came over, and he said, is is there anything in the backpack? And I said, no, no, no. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, like, hike across the thing with the heavy backpack. And he's like, actually... He's like, I think it would be better if you had the heavy on the sh your shoulders and I see the way you walk. And I was like, are you, are you joking me? And uh, he said, no, I think it's better. And then he just like walked off. I was like, oh my God. Um, so I ended up carrying it the whole time. And I was, I've never been as strong <laughs> as I was after that movie. I had some back problems. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask about the delightful um, hobo time scene. That was really, really nice to watch. And so I just wanted to ask uh, Cheryl and uh, Nick Henrys, did that, that actually come from a real experience that actually happened on the trip? And how was it writing that and performing a scene as daft as that? It, it's absolutely real and true. Just about everyone in the book has come out of the woodwork and found me again. I looked for people when I was writing the book, but those yeah, I couldn't... They and they've come out, but the one person I haven't found is Jimmy Carter of the Hobo Times. Um, You're out there. I I, re, I really I researched. You must remember this was He's the editor of Vogue. <laughs> This was 1995, before the internet and such. So, I, but when I was writing the book, I went and searched for the Hobo Times online, couldn't find them. And the hobos aren't very good at archiving, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> materials and such. But I never have found him. But it was, it was one of those experiences that I always want to stand up when the, in the film and say, this really actually happened, just as you see, because it seems so bizarre. And, and those details of like what was in the hobo care package, um, they're, they're, I wrote them down in my journal, you know, as I was drinking that beer. And, and um, they, it really did happen that way. So I loved it uh, that it made it into the script in the film as well. Um, I wondered at what stage of the casting um, your daughter um, got the role of you as a younger you. Um, um, was it your idea, um, and was she aware that she was actually playing you as a sort of five or six year old? Oh, absolutely. So the film had actually started production, um, and Bruna and Jean-Marc had met my daughter Bobby and said she she looks like 
Reese, you know, young Reese, and would she like to play the role? And so I talked to no, her about said, it. Would she like to audition? Would she like to audition? Uh -huh. And that was, <laughs> they were like, they were like, we're not going to just hand this to her. So I talked to her and she, I said, you'll have to be in some unhappy scenes. She knows that I didn't have a good father and you'll be in some happy scenes with the woman who plays your mother. And she just said no right away. So we just left it. But some time went by, they couldn't find the young Cheryl, and she overheard me talking to my husband about it. And she just said from the back seat of the car, I want to audition. So then we tried to talk her out of it, because we wanted her to really want this. And we went for the audition, and she sent me and my husband out of the room. Um, she was alone with Jean-Marc and the, the casting director, and she auditioned and, and got the role. And she was so such a hard worker and so fantastic. I, I, I've never been more proud of her. And of course, it was really emotional for me to watch my daughter be you know, present with this man playing my father who's saying terrible things, who's doing terrible things to um, her and her mother and her brother. And, and then, on the contrary, to have her dancing with Laura and leaping into Laura's arms. I, I really, it was like watching my life flash before me. And, it, it, you know, if writing heals some wounds, in so many ways, witnessing the making of this movie healed those too. And never more powerfully than when I was watching my daughter live my childhood. She wants to be an actress now. Um, <laughs> but, but if you asked her every time, I say, now get ready, because somebody might ask you, like, well, why do you want to be an actor? And she says, donuts, craft services. <laughs> um, and I'm like, I think you have to have something more than that. I don't, I mean, were you, did you go into it for donuts? No. <laughs> How much did you talk before filming? And Reese, was there anything in particular that Cheryl said that really stuck with you while you were? out there in the wilderness? Um, yeah, we actually, we spent a lot of time as the, the script was being developed and Nick was writing and we were talking. Um, so, yeah, and then right before we started shooting, I flew up to Portland to hang out with her and spend more time with her. Um, and we got to, oh, we spent your birthday together. We spent my birthday together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and she actually had the benefit too of her being on set almost every day, um, other than when she was on uh, speaking engagements. She and her husband were there, so it actually helped me. It was encouraging. I, I think in some ways I was a little scared in the beginning, like, oh, my God, am I going to – she's going to be watching me, and then she's going to be judging me, and I don't know if I can do this. But it, she was actually this incredibly loving, supportive presence, um, and that sometimes she'd come and it would actually help me get into the scene. Um, just yeah, and I had the book to to read over and over and over again. So, one thing Reese doesn't know, she tells that story about how Jean Marc came up to her and said, "You you can't have newspaper in the pack." It was because I watched Reese walking in that newspaper pack, and I said, "I can tell that the the pack isn't weighed down. She should be actually carrying a heavy pack." <laughs> that was you. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> That was me, and we could. Are you the one who made me wear the shorts when it was like 30 degrees? <laughs> that, that was me. Oh, yeah, that, that, was, yeah. that was Bruna. Every day, Reese was like, I, I think it's a pants day. It's a sweatpants day. And then Reese, Bruna would be like, it's supposed to be July, damn it. You're wearing shorts. Um, that's one thing. It was, it was cold. and I, I mean, I will say there was so much um, that, you know, we talk about what Reese and I talked about in preparation for the role. One of the things I admire about Reese so deeply is, and I think probably any great actress does this, is that, that you have to, it has to begin with the self. You have to be brave enough to tell your truth in order to tell a story that matters to anyone else. You know, there, that, that is the way <coughs> to the universal narrative, is to be brave enough to tell your truth. And so many of the conversations that Reese and I had that, that, you know, were, I guess, in preparation for the film, weren't about the film at all. They weren't about my hike at all. They were about our lives, just talking about our childhoods, talking about relationships we've had, talking about ourselves as mothers and, um, you know, the, everything from the mundane to the extraordinary. And I think that that's how you prepare to be revelatory in your work. And that's really what we did. It wasn't like, okay, you hook up the backpack here. There was some of that. But the more important work was just 
um, really opening ourselves up to each other. I guess just following on from that last question, I'd like to know, you mentioned earlier that your director had a real sense of urgency to tell this story. I'm curious, could you elaborate on for you the essence of, of Cheryl's journey, her story, that made you feel that same sense of urgency? And now you have brought it to the screen. Apart from stronger back muscles, what have you taken away from the experience? Um, definitely the hardest movie I've ever done in my entire life, um, for many different reasons. Uh, the physicality was really difficult, but after the physicality was definitely the, the part I was dreading the most was the emotional part of it. Um, the grief, the, the divorce, the, <laughs> the sex scenes were the hardest thing for me to do, honestly. So hard. I remember <laughs> writing Cheryl like the night before, I was like, I, I, I don't know how I'm, I'm supposed to have sex with two strangers tomorrow. <laughs> Basically, I'm going to shake their hand and like have sex with them in an alley. I've never had to do anything like that in my entire life. Um, so Cheryl came to set that day. <laughs> I was like, thanks for coming today. I was like, I can't believe you've never done this. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to tell myself, like, look at <laughs> If she was brave enough to be completely open as an artist and talk about those things, I couldn't just do the parts of it that I was comfortable with, you know? I, I, I had to do all the parts of the movie, the parts that made me feel uncomfortable, too, because it is about emotional honesty. Um, and so I said to Cheryl, I was like, I can't believe I have to do this today. And she said, she came up and she goes, I'm so sorry I was such a slut in the night. <laughs> <laughs> On that subject of sex, I have read in the British newspapers, don't believe every word I read in those, that you, you, had, you were hypnotized before the sex scenes. Is that... yeah, I'm afraid that is something that is appearing in the British press. Are you serious? Well, it's... It, it, right. It says you have to be hypnotized before you have sex at all. That's how the Brits do it. Is that you guys? That's untrue. Right. And the second, uh, another thing is Cheryl talked about exercising her demons on this incredible trail. When you took the part and when you played her role, did you exercise any demons yourself in yourself? Um, certainly. I mean, I think it's a it's a very personal film in a lot of ways. Um, and I think I didn't really discover how personal it was until I was already halfway there. And I would send Cheryl emails and while I was doing things that I, I mean, there's aspects of it that everybody knows that I've gone through, which are, you know, divorce and struggles with, you know, all kinds of things. But there's other things that people don't know about me. And, um, and it, it became very personal, you know, it's about, for me, a lot of it is about finding yourself one step at a time completely alone and I think everyone who's ever made it this far in life any age in life realize that there's a day you wake up and you realize I'm all alone no one's riding in on a on a white horse and saving me and um, the thing I thought was so extraordinary about the piece of material about the book itself and we hoped for the movie I said to Bruno before we started I said if we can pull this off it might be the first time in history the first time a woman's in a movie, and she ends the movie with no man, no money, <laughs> no parents, no job, no opportunities, and it's a happy ending. And not very good shoes, either. <laughs> I've seen that in, uh, during the last few years, there's been a kind of uh, spirituality in, uh, in your choices. Uh, and there it's not in some ways. Uh, and. Uh, this one and even the good lie. Uh, are you looking in a more interesting uh, and uh, deep way to what happens around you? Um, certainly, and I think you know it's a it's a great responsibility to have a platform where you bring movies to an audience globally. You know, I think I think you have to be mindful of what you want to say. I mean, certainly there's, I do popcorn movies. I, I love those movies too. I have a great time doing them. And comedy, interestingly enough, has sometimes in my career, it's extraordinary to me how much it affects people. Um, but a film like this is, in, in a way to me, it's bigger than a movie. Um, because of, you know, I saw it the other day with my mother um, and, I, and Laura Dern 
she saw it with her parents, and they all held ha- our mothers held hands as they watched the movie. It was really beautiful. But it, the conversation that I had with my mother and Laura's mother afterwards was probably one of the most important conversations of my life. Um, just about realizing what it means to be a mother or a daughter, knowing that our mothers were seen and understood, it was profound for them. And those aren't conversations that you have, you know, around the Thanksgiving table or at Christmas time because you're busy or the kids are running around. But to take the time to really contemplate who you are as people, with people that you love, I think that's one of my um, favorite parts of this film is that people are sharing it with people they love. How's the story of the woman's sort of conquering, conquering nature? How is it being told right now? How's, how does that tie in with the current wave of feminism? Well, I've been a feminist all my life. I learned the word when I was like five or six. And I do think it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, s- suddenly we're hearing so much more about um, feminism and, and I guess mainstream culture. And I think it's, I think it's finally that, um, there are so many powerful women, so many intelligent women, so many ambitious women who are just very tired of being on the sidelines. And so, you know, we didn't plan, I didn't plan for this book um, to be this sort of like iconic, you know, story of a feminist. I, it was simply me writing my story. And I think that we didn't plan this as a film, but you like, you hear Bruna and Reese talk about the reasons they founded their company. And, you know, it was all about, we're just go- not going to sit quietly anymore. And, you know, the work that women who came before us have done was, you know, got us so far, but it didn't get us all the way. And so now we're just stepping forth. Um, I think, and people are noticing it. I'm writing about it within that context, but I think it, it's born out of just a very natural um, desire to uh, take ourselves seriously and be seen as such. I really wasn't afraid on my hike. I um, wasn't afraid of most of the men I met. I, wa- I mean, I think it's it's not a sh- it's not a surprise to most women that we are strong and that we can you know do things that that other people tell us that we shouldn't or can't do I, I think that's an important part of the book as well I mean that I think that I thought was amazing in books is that we're taught even as little girls be afraid mm. be afraid don't wear that skirt you know don't go out alone cross your legs <laughs> you know and I think one of the really great things about the book and the film is that um, it, it, you know, it, she forgives herself of her sexual experiences, you know, and I feel like so many, so many times we're told as a woman to be ashamed, be ashamed of any experience that you have, and I think it's really a, a revelation to have a character, a woman in film going, what if I was supposed to sleep with all those guys? What if I learned something about it? What if that's okay? And I, I, I think that was extraordinary. I wondered, Reese, when we last met in Harare, in 1993, in a far-off place, whether making that film, there was anything that uh, you recall from that when you were doing this, and secondly, whether, uh, if you could tell us what the most recent uh, physical life challenge you've had uh, that wasn't filmmaking. Oh, yeah. Wow, I forgot about that movie. Hi! Hi! Yeah, I do. Well, kind of. <laughs> really, I've had a few kids. T- talking about physical life experience, probably having kids, three children, was a physical experience, not to be forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah, I was. It was a movie, a Disney movie, where a boy and I walk across the Kalahari Desert. You're right, three thousand miles. <laughs> but we didn't. <laughs> and I really carried a very light backpack with newspaper stuff. <laughs> Cheryl, I'm interested in the casting of your mother. Was that something that was particularly difficult for you? It was. I wouldn't say it was difficult. It was painful for me to contemplate my mother's death being reenacted, and it was striking that Jean-Marc chose to do it so accurately. What I wrote in the book about how my mother dies and how I found out she was dead and all of those details are seared into my memory, into my mind, and I wrote about them very honestly in the book. And then Jean-Marc and Reese and the the actors and Laura recreated that. And so I always cry at that scene. 
Um, it was really important to me that Laura understand who my mo mother was, that she wasn't, um, she was this incredibly gloriously good mother. I think we g seldom get to see that, right? When do you get to see a good mom who's not idealized, who's, who's imperfect, who's human? And I wanted Laura to, um, to know that, that about my mom. She and I spent quite a lot of time talking about both of our mothers and ourselves as mothers. And she brought all of that into the role. So it wasn't hard. It was, it was, I would, I would say that the word I feel is, is just so lucky. I think that, that she and my mother share this enormous optimism. You know, a reporter recently, uh, called Laura Dern sunshine in human form. And I think that that's very accurate. My mother was that too. When I was a teenager, that annoyed the shit out of me. Um, but now I think it's one of the greatest gifts of my life.